We have the derivative. We spent, we spent a fair bit of time introducing the derivative and considering the its many of its uh, fundamental important properties. And indeed, we spent some time considering the proofs of those properties, considering the careful, rigorous arguments needed to establish those needed to establish those properties. So we're coming on now to start to look at various applications of the term, various uses we can make of it. Okay. So this is back here at the bottom of page uh, bottom of page sixty one. Just mentions some of the applications we're going to look at. What we're going to concentrate today on is uh, finding and classifying stationary points of functions. Uh, so we're skipping over a little bit in the notes about Taylor series. I'll come back and say some more about Taylor series tomorrow, probably. But for the moment, we're going forward to this section on page 63 about stationary points of functions. So remember, the derivative, the derivative is this measure of the rate of change of the function at a particular point. So when these functions represent uh, meaningful things to us, um, we quite often like to pick out um, significant points in their behavior. Okay? These functions represent some kind of uh, cost to us, the, the, the expense of doing some procedure or building some object or performing some action. Very often the natural inclination is to minimize cost, minimize the financial cost. Or on the, in another view, if, if we have some functional expression of a profit from some kind of process, well, naturally many people are interested in maximizing profit. Okay. So there's two, just briefly said, two applications where two aspects of us wanting to get a mathematical description of optimal behavior be that minimizing a certain quantity or maximizing a certain quantity. So this is, this is the idea of stationary points of functions. Okay? So a stationary point, they're sometimes called turning points. Stationary point of a function is a point, so we're, we're thinking of functions of a single real variable, real value functions. We very much think of these functions in terms of the graphs. So stationary point or turning point, by definition, is one where the derivative of the function vanishes, okay. where the derivative of the function is equal to zero. What do they look like? Well, they come in two main, two main flavors, but then a third possibility as well. So they can either be a, a, a local minimum of, of the function. So in the top graph, some kind of graph of some function, but this point indicated here, this is an interesting point, because locally, in a neighborhood around that point, it achieves the minimal, the minimum value. Okay. The function is changing its behavior as you move through that point. As, as you approach that point from the left, the function is decreasing. As you move away from the point on the right, the function increases away. Yeah. So it's, it's achieving the minimum value, at least in some neighborhood of the point. So it's, it's what, what we call a local minimum. There may well be other areas in the domain of the function where the function might still achieve lower values, but at least locally, at least in some domain, that point is, is an optimal point in a, in a minimum sense. It achieves the lowest possible value. Or, on the other hand, we might have this kind of behavior. We can, you know, if this kind of example, this point here is similarly a local maximum. At least in some neighborhood at that point, I mean, in some neighborhood of the domain at that point, so this point looks like it's located at minus two, in some region around minus two, that point is the optimal point. It, it, it maximizes the value of the function. So these are our, these are our, these are our functions that we, that we might want to optimize. Now, stationary points, according to the definition, they're points of where the derivative vanishes. So they can, uh, there, there is a third possibility. And these are called points of inflection. And points of inflection are like a mixture. They're simultaneously a minimum and maximum. They're kind of half minimum, half maximum. 
they, they display aspects of growth behavior. In this function, the derivative does look like it's zero. If you imagine the tangent line to the graph at that point, the tangent line is, is going to be exactly horizontal. Right? That's, what the, that's, what the, that's what the plot suggests. Okay? As you approach this point from the left, the function is increasing towards the point, but its rate of increase is decreasing all the time as you get close to the point. Until when you're actually moving through the point at that moment, the function has got a zero rate of change because the graph has become flat and exactly horizontal. Then as you move away from the point, the function is increasing very slowly at first, okay, because it's going from a zero rate of change at the point. But as it moves away from the point to the right, the function starts to increase. And its rate of increase is increasing. So it kind of looks like a minute. If you only looked at one side of it, you would say it was a maximum. If you only looked at the other side of it, you'd say it was a minimum. But when you look at the whole thing, it kind of mixes the two kind of aspects. Okay? So this is a stationary point. Momentarily, instantaneously, the function is stationary at that point. It is it has a rate of change of zero at that point. So we're soon going to get, get into some examples, but we describe a typical procedure where of, of, of how we, given a, given a description of the function, typically it comes in the form of some kind of formula or some kind of expression for the function in terms of standard functions. Uh, how can we decide how the discover where the stationary points are, and secondly, decide what type of So it's a two-step process. The first, the first step is, if we can, we can obtain a nice formula for the derivative of the function, and we're looking for the zeros of that, zeros of the derivative. Okay, so we're solving the equation where the first derivative is zero. Looking for all the solutions of that, all the points where the tangent line to the graph of the function is, is flat. Then when we have that collection of points, we'll be interested in finding out what type each one is. Okay. If we have a nice version of the graph of the function, we might visually inspect the graph. Okay. To be absolutely sure, to reach a rigorous conclusion, we then pass to the second derivative. Because the second derivative tells us about the rate of change of the rate of change of the function. The rate of change of the first derivative. The derivative of the first derivative. The second derivative tells us the rate at which the first derivative is changing. And local maxim maximums are characterized by the fact that we have a positive, positive first derivative to the left of the function. So the, the point A is a local maximum if we have an increasing rate of change to the left of A and decreasing change to the right of A. Overall, what's happening to the value of the first derivative as you pass through A at a maximum? Overall, the value of the first derivative is decreasing. So it's passing from positive values through to negative values. Okay, so the first derivative, as you pass through a local maximum, is definitely decreasing. And that behavior we can pick up equivalently by discovering or showing that the second derivative is negative. So the second derivative measures the rate of change of the first derivative. If that's negative, it means the first derivative is decreasing as you pass through the station. And a decreasing first derivative as you pass through the stationary point is what characterizes local maximum. Because we have high rate of increase, becoming lower rate of increase, becoming zero rate of change, then becoming low rates of decrease, passing to higher rates of decrease. That's what happens to the first derivative as you pass through the station. So that can be detected by, by finding that the value of the second derivative is negative. Similarly, at local minimums, this, this, the signs of everything just, just changes. Because local minimums are just local maximums where everything is flipped. So the behavior of the first derivative as you pass through a minimum is characterized by a negative first derivative to the left of the to the left of the function because the, as you approach a minimum from the left the function has to be decreasing towards the minimum the definition of the minimum 
But then as you pass through the minimum point and emerge at the other side, your function is increasing again, because you've just passed through a minimum. So the first derivative changes to positive values. It's then changing to an increasing function as you move away from the minimum. So that's what characterizes minimums. The first derivative is passing from negative values through to positive values. So what's the first derivative doing in that passage through the stationary point? It's increasing. Okay. So that's discovered by observing a positive value for the second derivative. The second derivative is the rate of increase of the first derivative. The points of inflections then are the ones that don't fit into either, that don't come out as either of those two categories. Okay. Points of inflection are ones where the first derivative has the same behavior either side. In this one, it's increasing to the left and it's still increasing to the right. Okay. Its, its rate of increase slows down to nothing, but then starts to increase again. But it is increasing all the time as you pass through the as you pass through the pass through the stationary point, except for momentarily at the stationary point. You could imagine this thing flipped with the horizontal <coughs> axis, and it could observe similar behavior, still the same behavior either side. It could be decreasing to the station to the stationary point, momentarily halting at the stationary point, but then continuing to decrease again. So the same type of behavior either side of the station. Okay. So if you observe that kind of behavior, or indeed the second derivative being equal to zero, so similar classification, then then you probably got a point of inflection. Okay. So that's the basic outline of the, pro of the procedure for finding and classifying. Okay. So we'll have a look at some examples now. Um, the first couple of examples here in the notes, there's, there's no real meaning attached to the things, but we'll soon get on uh, and look at some more interesting examples where we're actually attaching some meaning to the contents. Okay. So uh, in the first First case, we're dealing with a relatively simple polynomial, x cubed minus x. So why is x cubed minus x? We want to determine the turning points. Find where the turning points or stationary points are and classify them. Okay. Well, so we examine the first derivative. It's 3x squared minus 1. And we must examine that equal to 0. Just perform the algebraic steps needed to solve that. Put the 1 over the other side, divide by 3, take square roots. We find we got two solutions to that equation, positive square root of three of, of the third and the negative square root of the third. These are probably two stationary points. We then obtain the second derivative, which comes out as 6x. And we evaluate the second derivative at these two points. We're not so much interested in the exact numerical value. We're rather interested in classifying that as being a positive or negative. We get a positive quantity at x1, a negative quantity at x2. So that would say that the point x1, we know it's a stationary point, and if we've got positive second derivative, it means the function is, the rate of change is increasing as you pass through, as you pass through that function. So it's changing from a negative rate of increase, from your point of view, as you approach the point from the left, passing through to a positive rate of increase. So that's a minimum function, local minimum. Vice versa, for the point x2, we've got a negative second derivative, so that would be a local, a local maximum. There's a second example outlined there, but it pretty much goes through exactly the same steps. Okay. Polynomial equation passed the first, first derivative. It's a bit more complex here. It's higher order. First derivative will be 12x cubed minus 12x squared. We want to solve that equal to zero. When, you, when you're solving expressions equal to zero, you really want to, as much as possible, factorize the expressions. Okay? Because the product of, it's easy to say when a product of factors is zero. A product of different factors can only be zero when, a, when, one of the fact, when, a, when at least one of the factors is zero. Factoring is always a good thing to do, when, even if it's, you know, whether it's a polynomial or whether it's some other kind of expression. Factoring is always good to do when you're looking for zeros. So that 12x cubed minus 12x squared can be factorized. We can take out the quantity 12x squared, and it's multiplying its complementary factor x minus 1. We're looking for the zeros of this. And it's very easy to say what the zeros of this are, because it can only be zero if the x squared bit is zero or the x minus 1 bit is zero. 
with any other situation, if both of the parts are non-zero, you multiply them together, you get a non-zero number. The only way to get a zero out of a product is to have one of the factors zero. So that tells us what the solutions are. Well, x squared is only zero when x itself is zero, and x minus one is zero when x is one. That gives us these two locations for station plots. Um, when you look at this, the first of them it isn't a maximum or minimum. When you examine what's going on close to zero, if you're close to zero either side, the quantity zero my, uh, x minus one will always be negative. If you're very close to zero, you subtract one, you're going to be negative. But the quantity x squared will always be positive, no matter what the value of x is. If you're close to zero, well, x squared is just always non-negative. So when you're close to zero, you've got a positive number multiplied by a negative number. So overall, you've got a negative number, no matter which side of zero you are. When you're either side of zero, the first derivative is always negative. So the function is constantly decreasing, constantly decreasing both before and after passing through the station. So that means it must be a point of inflection. Coming down from the left, decreasing, decreasing, passing through the stationary point, inflecting here, and then continuing to decrease as it moves away. The other point, however, is different. If we were to check the second derivative of this and evaluate it at uh, this point one, well, the claim is there that it comes out as a local as a local mean, that we would see a positive value for the second derivative. So those, those two examples, fairly briefly, outlines, outlines the process. Um, but I'd like to look at a few more examples now, but maybe beefing up their meaning a little bit, making them, making them mean something, and also introducing the idea of objective functions and and constraints. Okay, so I've got one example here, and there are also some examples of this on some of the mock papers for the in-class test. So I hope they get onto at least one of those as well. So this is uh, an optimization example. There, an optimization example. So here's the description. Um, we require a rectangular box with no lid, so an open box, three times, three times as long as it's wide, and it must have a volume, must have a volume of, let's say, 50 cubic meters. It's a pretty big box. Oh, sorry, script and no lid, sorry. <coughs> Six-sided box, box with the lid. I hope we have no lid here. <coughs> now, but the, whatever the requirements for this box are, the material, the material for the top and bottom, maybe that has to be quite sturdy, and that material costs ten pounds per square meter. Whereas the material for the sides, meaning the vertical sides of the box, slightly cheaper, that costs six pounds per square meter. Now, what's the what's the request? The the request, of course, is not to build the most expensive box. That would be silly. To build the cheapest box. <coughs> build the cheapest such box. So we come across these kinds of problems a lot. 
and it frustrates some people. But what these kind of problems are attempting to do is attempting to give nice examples of, you know, that, that illustrate some aspects of the modeling process. Taking some kind of a, a description, a non you know, or a not very mathematical description of a problem, converting it to the mathematical objects and applying the tools and the techniques that we have. Now, no real situation is ever as simple as this. I mean, there are other costs that go into making a box. You know, what exactly is happening at the, at the hinges or the connections between these two things? How expensive are they? Would it be simpler just to build it out of the same material? Might simplify the joins. Box is very wide, that might have additional production costs. You might be able to make it on the current benches and equipment you have. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the real life is a lot more complicated than that. But at least there's some kind of multiple factors involved here that we attempt to show some of the some of the procedures and principles that we use for building the mathematical model of these things. Okay, so well, let's start. Well, let's sketch a little picture. Get started. It must be three times as long as it's wide. So it's going to have a certain length, it's going to have a certain width, and it's going to have a certain height. So you've got length, width, height. And all six sided, all six sides need to be constructed. Well, we just keep writing down stuff. Um, we need to know about the volume of the box. Oh, three times as long as it's wide. Three times as long. So, so the L has to be three times W. Okay, so we're trying to encode, encode the various facts that we're getting. So three times as long as it's wide. Okay, we got that. L is three times W. We're given information about the volume. What is the volume of this box? Volume B is, well, okay, what's the formula for the volume of a box? The volume for a box is quite simple. It's just the product of the three dimensions. Okay, the volume of this box is L times W times H, and that's required to be 50. But that's equivalent now, you see, at the moment it looks like the volume depends on three parameters, L, W, and H. But we already have a nice relationship between two of the parameters. The length and width are not independent of this box, because there's a requirement that it be three times as long as Y. So we shouldn't really keep these two <coughs> parameters in the problem. We should just use one, okay? because one of them is directly a scaled version of the other one. So let's get rid of any mention of L. We'll just talk in terms of W. So this is saying the same that the volume, which is 3W squared times H, that that must be equal to H. <coughs> this, is, this is a, which is a volume constraint. We're not trying to maximize the volume or anything. The problem does not want the volume to change. It wants the volume to be exactly 50 cubic meters. It's going to hold some kind of powder or something. It has to be able to hold that, that volume of material. But the 50 isn't going to change. It's, that's, a, that's a constraint, something that's constraining our options, constraining our choices. What we do want to change is cost of the materials. We want to build the cheapest box. So we need a cost function. need a cost function C. It's going to depend on two quantities. It's, probably, it's going to be, at least at the beginning, it's going to be a two-variable two function. We don't need all three variables because the L, remember, is explicitly given in terms of the W. So maybe our box is determined by the height and the width. So our cut, we need the cost function for the height and the width. So let's, let's assemble it. <coughs> Well, the top and bottom cost T 
10 pounds per square meters. So there's two of those sides. The, the area of the top and bottom is L times W. And each of those cost um, each of those cost uh, ten pounds per square meter. What? Well, put in the L's. We'll get rid of the L's in a second. <clears throat> the vertical sides. Well, there's four vertical sides. They come in pairs, don't they? Because the long sides are the same area and the short sides are the same area. It's two sides which have to cost six pounds per square meter and they have area um, L times H. And then there's the other two sides still cost six pounds per square meter, but they have size W times H. <coughs> so this is our material cost function. This is the thing we want to, this is the thing we can change because there are cheap versions of this box or expensive versions. We want to minimize the cost. Um, we've still got our L, I said I'd get rid of the L, but I put it down there. So we want to get rid of the L because the L after all is just three times the W. And that simplifies the situation. Okay. So if I replace L with three times W, we've got two by 10 by three, which is uh, 60, 60 times W squared. And we've got 12 WH, and this will turn into 3 times W. So we'll again have WH, but there'll be an extra factor of 3, so it'll be 36. So we'll have 36 WH from here, and an extra 12, so 48 WH. Right. Uh, two by six by three. Twelve by three is thirty-six, and an extra twelve is forty-eight. Forty-eight Okay. So this is the function we want to we want to optimize, and this is a two-variable function. We haven't gone into the calculus or analysis of two variable functions yet. We might run into a problem, but you see, we're forgetting our constraint. We've got this volume constraint. We still haven't done anything with the volume constraint. We've formulated it, we've put it down on the page. But we need to impose, okay? We need to impose the constraint. We need to consider, consider the cost. We don't want the cost of any old box. We want the cost subject to the volume constraint. The volume constraint, that's equivalent to uh, 3w squared h equals 50. So, you know, how, how do you want to work this? Do you want to, well, what, what this is saying is that the width and the height are no longer independent. If you're just talking about any old box under the sun, you could build at any dimensions. You've got three independent dimensions. But the information, the question said L is 3W. This volume constraint now, what we see, the, the role it's playing is it's exactly relating W and H. They are no longer independent. If the height is decided, the W is decided at the same time, because it has to meet the constraint. Or vice versa, if somebody decided on what width it should be, that dictates what height it should be because it has to satisfy the constraint. How do we proceed with this algebraically? Well, we write one of the variables in terms of the others. So we'll write our h as 50 over 3 times uh, w squared. So that implies that our cost function which was originally a cost function of two variables, we can now think of it as just cost function of a single variable w, because we can eliminate the h from being explicitly mentioned. 
because the h is given in terms of the w. <coughs> so it's going to be 60w squared, let's go at that bit, plus 48w times 50 over 3w squared. So that's 60 over w squared plus, and um, what's well 5 times 48, and it's 200. Um, 5 times 40 is 200, and uh, an extra uh, 40, 240 plus 0, 2,400. All right. Yeah. Oh, forget, forgetting my 3, 2,400. Over three, 2400 over three is 800. 800. I thought my notes had a mistake. 800 over W. Yeah, and, and, and the W over W squared is W. So now this is good. You know, if you look back at the original problem, I think now we fully take into account. We've taken account of all the information in the problem. Three times as long as it's y. That was L equals 3w. Volume constraint. Yeah, we got it down. The volume constraint turned into an explicit relationship between the remaining variables h and w. We then substituted that relationship in. So although the height isn't mentioned here, although the height isn't mentioned here, this Turn down the music. Okay. Everybody can hear the music. Um, because we've encoded the volume constraint here, we've encoded the volume constraint. So this cost function is the cost of building one of those boxes that's W meters wide. Everything else is already built in and encoded into the cost. So a box that's W meters wide and meets the specifications, this is the cost of it. So we can go ahead now and look for stationary points of C. So now we look for stationary points of C. So we differentiate <coughs> C. We're looking at DC, DW. Yep. The derivative of dcdw, well, differentiating 60w squared, so 120w. And we're differentiating 800 over w, which will be minus 800 over w squared. And we're seeking stationary points. So we must solve this equation equal to zero. That's the definition of a stationary point. Now, um, what's that equivalent to? Well, okay, it looks a little bit intimidating. You've got W's above and below the line, but see, it's zero on the other side. So one simplification thing to do here is just to multiply both sides by W squared. Because then it will become 100 W cubed minus 800 equals zero. That's, a, that's got a lot of simple to understand. We can very easily pass to the solutions of that equation because it just becomes W cubed is 800 over 120. And 800 over 120 is going to, of course, simplify it because 20 over 3, 40 goes into each. And that's true if and only if W. It's just the cube root of 20 over 3. It's only one solution, only one value of W. Cube root of 20 over 3. Now, we've only got one stationary point. 
we can go on, we can check the second derivative and go on and classify it, but we could probably determine that, could probably reason that, um, probably reason that that has to be a minimum point. I mean, if you think about, think about the original problem, if you were to be a bit silly, could you build a very, very expensive box that satisfies the constraints? Yeah, you could build a very, very expensive box, because if you think of the top and bottom, we could easily make the top, the top and bottom faces as low. We could make those massive, cover the whole room. And we could still satisfy the volume constraint by just making the box extremely short. It's, it's a ginormous box, very wide tops and bottoms, but it's only like millimeters tall or whatever. And that, you, you, by, by choosing it appropriately short, we could still keep the volume constrained of it. But obviously that box, because it has massive tops and bottoms, it'd be extremely expensive. And you could keep going with that process. You could just make the top and bottoms as arbitrarily large as you could, as, as you desired. So you could increase the cost of the box to anything and still satisfy all the constraints. So that kind of suggests that there is no maximum value for the cost function. We can build arbitrarily expensive boxes. Obviously, as you, as you take one of those huge boxes and make it more reasonable, right, decrease the size of the tops and bottom faces, you'll have to make the box taller, it'll become a more typical box, and its costs will be getting cheaper because you're decreasing those huge tops and bottoms. And eventually, it should reach some minimum cost as well. Eventually, it should reach some minimum cost. So we can kind of, you know, we, we, we kind of get a feeling that this kind of has to be a has to be a local minimum. But we could keep going and just um, check the second derivative. So d squared c d w squared second derivative. Well, we've got our first, our simple, our nicest expression for the first derivative is up here. So that has a derivative of one hundred and twenty. And the derivative of minus 800 over W squared is going to be plus uh, 3 times 800 over W cubed. Two, two, sorry, excuse me, 2 times. 2 times 800 over W cubed. So that's 120 plus uh, 1600 W cubed. Now remember, for classifying the point, we're interested in what kind of sign this has. Can we evaluate it at the stationary point? Well, the stationary point is some positive number. I mean, that's approximately, approximately 2 root of 7. Something a little bit over 1. 2 root of 7. Yeah, because the cube of 2 is 8. So, so this quantity W is something between 1 and 2. So when you put whatever it is in here, it's certainly the whole thing is certainly going to be positive. I mean, it's positive. It's going to be positive everywhere. Well, it, it might be negative at negative values of W, but you can't build a box with a negative width. So it's certainly positive. So we have a positive second derivative. But this means, this means that this is a minimum. This is the minimum point, the minimum. With width of the minimum cost box. The actual values that when you start to evaluate these things, the width is, is approximately 1.88 meters. The length, remember, which is three times the width, that would be approximately 5.65. And the height is exactly 50 over 3w squared, and you can just evaluate the thing, so that's approximately 4.71 meters. So we now know exactly the dimensions of the box. Um, I haven't expressed the cost, but you can feed these values now back into, or you can just go back to your C, up here, C of W, and evaluated at this uh, cube root of 
and the other three, you could actually find the minimum cost as well. Okay. So, okay, I didn't have time to do the one from the second mock, but tomorrow, uh, tomorrow there's a few examples of these stationary type problems on the mock paper. So we'll go through the solutions of those tomorrow as well. Uh, and those are more examples of these kind of wordy, wordy problems where you need to convert the description into the mathematical description and then, uh, and then proceed accordingly. Okay, so we'll continue doing more examples of these tomorrow. Yeah, yeah.